Our emotional programs for happiness formed in early childhood and fossilized into energy centers as a source of motivation for our thoughts, feelings, reactions, and behavior manifest themselves at every level of our human functioning. And as we were seeing uh, last time, they m manifest themselves in uh, desires for the symbols of whatever our particular emotional program is as crystallized in the culture. For instance, materialistic expression of our, uh, of our desire for security might be expressed in, as, in money, power, insurance policies, houses, or whatever is the symbol of security in the particular culture that uh, this human being might be in. And uh, we were speaking about the fact that even on the religious and spiritual levels of our functioning, these programs continue to uh, wend their merry way despite our good intentions and resolutions. And uh, the fact that we change our address, our, our name, our furniture, or our clothes, the fault self system readily adjust to the new situation as long as we don't ask it to change. You can change anything else and it'll go along with it, but not, don't ask it to drop dead. It just gets more defensive. So uh, you might think that once we begin the spiritual journey then and have bought into the values of the gospel, and the work and practice of the spiritual journey, that then <coughs> we would be safe. Not at all. The abstract, intellectual, conceptual, <laughs> or uh, de decision to buy into the gospel values doesn't touch the unconscious motivation, which is firmly in place by the time we reach the age of reason, and probably even firmer in place by the time we hear the invitation of the gospel to repent, that is, change the directions in which you're looking for happiness. And so it, we find ourselves sometimes in the centering prayer, in moments of dryness, uh, racked with uh, emotional uh, confrontations with our primitive feelings, sometimes dried out, sometimes feeling God is absent. And so the impatience one feels at that time, the annoyance, the boredom, as you reflect upon it, once again, that very reaction is the sign that you're trying to manipulate God. In other words, you're saying, I don't like it. Please change. Not me, but you. <laughs> I'd like to say the same. And God says, well, won't you please remember that the purpose of prayer is, is not to get what you want or to change me, but to change you, dear heart. Okay. So, so that takes a long time to get that message. And so the, the complaints that the holy people make about their prayers is, is simply uh, trying to get God to come around to their way of seeing things. Well. Uh, just a personal example, since uh, I'm the one I know best, and uh, when, I, when I emerged from the uh, early formation period at, Saint, uh, at, at the monastery where I entered uh, first, later burnt down, I, I had <laughs> joined the community because I was sold out on the idea of giving my life to pursuing contemplative prayer, which was uh, my understanding of the spiritual journey in those days. It didn't have such a, uh, quite that name that it has developed in the 60s and 70s and 80s. So I looked around for the most difficult order that I could find, and I think I succeeded. <laughs> the Trappists then were extremely strict. Uh, you could only speak to one or two people the abbot and the novice master, who were your superiors, who could send you away at any time. So, so having that much authority over you, it doesn't help a kind of easy relationship <laughs> of friendliness. So 
it, uh, it, uh, friendship was discouraged, and you couldn't do it anyway. And the only thing that was allowed were, uh, was the sign language, which was supposed to be limited to necessary speech or functional speech for work or for uh, calling people's attention to something useful, not for uh, ordinary human exchange. And so uh, in those days, I think the climate, probably still suffering a little from the Jansenistic tendencies that I mentioned earlier, was that the more penance you did, the closer you would get to God. And, and the harder the life was, the more likely you were to make progress in divine union or in contemplative prayer. And since that's what I had come uh, to identify with as my goal in life, I naturally wanted to spend as much time as I could in prayer, formal prayer, that is prayer in church. Now, the Trappists had invented a great many regulations, perhaps a little bit under the influence of the French uh, origins of the order, which have always been slightly militaristic <laughs> because of the French mentality. Well, anyway, the... <laughs> The, the, here, here I was uh, trying to keep all the rules as strictly as I could, and, and, uh, and I had bought into them hook, line, and sinker. And so uh, we had some free time, but not much. The, uh, the vocal prayers were much too long, very long. Took up a lot of time and energy. <laughs> we also had a lot of work, hard work. and. Uh, uh, and you got up at 2 in the morning and you went to bed about 7 at night and, and uh, there was a lot of fasting and the food wasn't too good and, and the vegetables out of the garden were a little bit tired by the time you got to March and so uh, it was a tough life. So I, I thought that the only way I could survive this thing was to pray and get on my knees and beg God's help and so on. So I used to go at every free moment, which was maybe a couple of hours a day, into the church. Once again, the church in those days was believed to be the ideal place to pray. Well, in actual fact, since we had no private rooms but, uh, and were only allowed to go to the dormitory to sleep and had to read in common, you were never alone. And, 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 and so the only place to go to pray, really, seemed to be the church. Well, the rule was if you pray in church, you either must stand or kneel. Sitting down was looked upon as a no-no because the Trappists had inherited a good dose of this Jansenistic view. So, so even to sit down for a few moments of Lexio in the, uh, up until... Uh, late in the 20th century, was considered uh, slightly ungenerous. <laughs> Father Merton, uh, Thomas Merton in his book, complains a little about that in his experience of Gethsemane. In his famous book, The Seven-Story Mountain, which highly romanticizes but accurately describes the kind of life that he entered into and that I joined maybe th three or four years later. It didn't begin to change and to be somewhat humanized until after Vatican II. So here I was, this generous young man had given up uh, quite a bit, family, friends, and, and some uh, people assured me I'd have a good career as a diocesan priest and so on, might become a bishop, and, and all that stuff just turned, me, turned my stomach because I was gun-ho for humility, and, and I, uh, I entered the order actually as a lay brother, that is, someone who does not go on to the priesthood, because there again I thought that would be more difficult, more generous, and I was ready, you know, to go the whole way, thanks to God's grace and, 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 and certain misconceptions about what the spiritual life really is, which took me about 25 years to find <laughs> out. Okay. The, a monastic or religious training is like becoming a child again in some ways because it's so strict and the authority and obedience is, is so universal that, uh, that you really regress to an earlier level, which is okay as a way of detaching yourself from your own will and judgment. 
But it's not so good if the novice master doesn't put you back together again as an adult by the time you, you uh, graduate from the formation program. And, and unfortunately, that didn't always happen in those days because the, the normal human means of growth, especially for a young person, were, were practically non-existent. And that's why the, uh, the order, uh, with the invitation of uh, the, some, of, uh, some documents of Vatican II, painfully went through the process of reevaluating its observances to bring them up to date to modern conditions and to also root them more deeply in the tradition. Remember the distinction I made between the tradition, the living tradition that you interiorize from the gospel or your particular religious charism, and traditions which are historically conditioned and can change and which should change when they're not working anymore in the present situation. And hence, constant renewal is the order of the day in any ongoing organization that is trying to pass on something useful from generation to generation. Uh, well, so here I was in there uh, doing the equivalent of zazen, I guess, only on my knees instead of on my butt. And so uh, I, I, I uh, spent all this time there. Well, now naturally, knees are not, it is probably the worst position in which to prolong prayer because it's bad for the back and it's hard on your knees. But here I was getting these calluses on my knees and hanging in there and experiencing from time to time some encouragement from the Lord, but not much. And, but I was, I was certain that if I stayed there, at least I would survive in this order and be able to fulfill my commitment. And so so uh, now about, I'd been there maybe a year or so, a little longer maybe, and another person comes in who seemed to have had the same idea generally. But he was an older man, uh, I think he was in his 40s, and uh, he, he was a widower, actually, and, and he started coming to church regularly during all the intervals. It wasn't customary to spend that much time for most of the other monks. They used to read or do other things. So he evidently had enough sense to get permission from the abbot to sit down during his <laughs> prayers. Uh, that would be a no-no for me. Any, any relaxation of the rule I would not be able to stomach at that point. I had to keep the hard and narrow way. Well, <laughs> this went on for a few months, and he would spend as much time as I was. And uh, sometimes I'd find him in there when I, after great uh, pains, had come rushing in from work and, and washed up very quickly and rushed upstairs, put on my cowl, and got on my knees, praying. <laughs> <laughs> to my horror, after a few months, Instead of my prayers, a certain thought started floating through my mind. How did he get in here ahead of me? <laughs> How did he get permission to sit down while I'm kneeling? And then every now and then, I couldn't help as you come in or go out, you take a furtive glance at whoever is there. He seemed to have this beatific smile on his face. <laughs> And I said, how is it, uh, my thoughts went like this, how is it that here I am on my knees killing myself, this guy is sitting down and he seems to be in the lap of the Lord, just <laughs> sopping up bliss right and left. And here I am with these. So now I began to recognize that these thoughts are what is called envy. <laughs> now, Jealousy is, is what protects your own good or what you think is good. Envy is what wants to take the good that others seem to have away because it's hurting your esteem or pride or something. So there's not the worst feeling than envy, green with envy, is, is, a, is a, as you know, a popular description. But here I was feeling in this holy place, in the most holy position, nearly, <laughs> in the most holy church <laughs> and trying to enter into divine union, the most holy kind of consciousness. And here I was committing the greatest sin, it seemed to me there was, which was to desire to take away someone else's spiritual good. Well, I knew enough about theology to know that that's 
the worst kind of envy. And so naturally the thought came to me, I was better before I came into this place. <laughs> so the thought comes, maybe or it would be better in another place. Why don't you leave? This is, this is what is called temptations of the demons. Or, and hopefully we'll get into that tomorrow when we study a paradigm of the spiritual journey in the Christian tradition. Well, anyway, this, this went on for literally for weeks or months, not necessarily in the same intensity with many feelings. I better give up prayer because whenever I come in, it starts. But I had enough sense to realize you shouldn't let your evil thoughts make you give up prayer. There must be some other way of doing it. Well, I, I really didn't have too much instruction except that our abbot was, was very uh, consoling and encouraging about persevering in prayer through thick and thin. He himself was a man of prayer with great devotion to prayer before the Blessed Sacrament, which is usually reserved in the monastic church. And so he also was very much aware of the purification that begins when you enter a life of strict silence and prayer in which the, you know, one's unconscious motivation begins to emerge into consciousness if you give it a chance. Well, it not only emerges into consciousness, the dark side of our personality begins to emerge existentially into your feelings. And so as I was sitting there uh, uh, feeling this horror, horrible a feeling and, and wishing it would go away and praying for it to go away and it just kept getting worse or it would go away a little while and come back worse than before. Well, every now and then as you're sitting there, perhaps at a bad, especially on a bad day when you've had a few other uh, put-downs and maybe you're fasting and your stomach is growing, uh, groaning and rolling, then, then, then this feeling almost translates into taste. So I could taste this feeling of envy. And I would think to myself, this must be what it is to sink your teeth into a piece of juicy manure. <laughs> <laughs> and now, and I'm the manure. This is me, for gosh sakes. And here, here I was thought so highly of before I came in, this generous young man, went to Mass every day and, and uh, taught catechism and all this stuff, and prayed. So I, I assure you, when we begin the spiritual journey, there's usually, there often is a period of great uh, enjoyment and great reassurance and, and freedom because you're, uh, the worst part of your life is kind of cleaned up and you experience a certain freedom. But this is only like, like uh, pruning a few branches on a tree. You still have to deal with the root. And so when the dust settles, you begin to confront your old temptations worse than before because now you're more honest, you're more open and vulnerable because of your sincerity and honest to the truth. And so, I, I'm sorry to say, for those of you who don't like this teaching, that <laughs> the truth is inevitable. Whatever it is, it's going to come up. And so the only way to avoid it is to be a phony or a fraud. So just sit there and soak it in without being discouraged. That's the great struggle, not to get discouraged. And it's so hard not to, There's an, especially when the divine assurance or reassurance or affirmation begins to recede. It seems that God wants us to know experientially just what he's been dealing with throughout our life. <laughs> and he expects us to receive this not as a reproach, but as a secret, as a friend revealing a secret to a friend. And he's so surprised when we don't like it, because this is the first time he's really allowed us to see the full truth. And so instead of saying thanks, we're about to get up and walk out and stay out. Now, here's my question. There's a happy ending to that story. I shouldn't leave that out. After about four or five years of struggling with it on and off, this gentleman and I uh, were thrown together in a situation after the fire where we got to know each other, and I discovered that, that he had the same problems I had in trying to get him to church and to fight for a little free time in order to pray. And, and in sympathizing with his situation, uh, my problem uh, 
vanished. And eventually he, we became great friends. He was a great support to me uh, throughout uh, the time I was uh, an abbot. So <laughs> relationships can change. But when they're not good and you have no guarantee that they'll ever change, it's, it's a very deep kind of trial or temptation. And I imagine the equivalent of that occurs in other forms of life of other forms of community life. Because on the spiritual journey, there always is someone in our life, our family, business, or religious community, or our social action, who we can't stand, who has a genius for bringing out the worst in us. And no matter what we do, we can't seem to improve this relationship. Well, this was the nature of, the, of, of, of my jealousy or envy towards this other religious. He hadn't done anything wrong. He wasn't doing anything. He was just minding his own business. It was my problem. But you see, God used this other person to reflect back to me what my problem was. So the person who gives you the most trouble in this world is the greatest gift that you have from God, if you can continue the spiritual journey. Because there's some dark places in our personality that even prayer or contemplative prayer doesn't light up. And so God works on us both from within or from without. The old famous cliche in religious circles uh, about purification. It's, it's a battering from without and a boring from within. So, so there's no escape, it seems, at certain times when purification is deep. Uh, God sort of gets after us with his compressor and starts digging <laughs> into the inmost corners of our, of, our, uh, <laughs> of our defense mechanisms, which are hiding the worst part of ourselves, and he loosens it up that way. And so when it arises, it's heavy. It's heavy. But if you can learn that this is a gift, this is really the problem, our attitude towards it. If we think it's the end of the world, as we usually do, naturally, but if there was a little more information <laughs> about the spiritual journey, that this is an invitation to a new depth of love, a new depth of relating to God on a more spiritual level, which requires a little scrubbing, a little emptying out, so that we can relate or hear that marvelous communication, that transmission of divine life, which can't come through if the noise of the false self is, is, is too strong. So it, it really is uh, a, a great gift. And we also must learn at this point in our spiritual journey, because we've started, once you start, God is totally on your side. There's no danger of that, whatever psychological experiences to the contrary you might have. So everything works together for good for somebody who's on the spiritual journey, no matter what you think or feel. You've got to believe it. And, and if you believe it, you save yourself an enormous amount of trouble analyzing self-pity, uh, ring, ring around the rosy, and so on. So to learn to be content with one's human misery, what uh, in, in some Buddhist circles is called maitri, exactly the same insight I'm speaking here, which is to, to welcome this dark side and to sympathize with it and to have compassion on it. And, and that's the truth, because most of our misery is rooted in the damage that was done to us knowingly or unknowingly by adults in our early life and are the means we took to cope with intolerable situations when we didn't have any kind of reason to evaluate what was happening to us. So <laughs> this is part of the journey. And the reason is very simple, but very profound, as most simple things really are. And that is that unless our heart is purified, God can't give us the kingdom because we would appropriate it for ourselves as long as these energy centers are in place or as long as there's a trace of them left of any significance. And since these are emotional programs, God's purification involves the emotions. 
and, and, and what he first teaches us, or rather alternates, is that our emotional programs are damaging and that our emotions are damaged by these programs. because They don't faithfully record life just as it is because they, they have to be filtered through the false self system before we perceive them. And also we need to feel the love of God at other times, Some, the peace, the consolation, the deep quiet, the letting, the capacity to surrender, which, which heals the emotions of some of their wounds and their emotional judgment that life isn't what it should be and that nobody loves me. And nobody could love me, especially God. All that baloney has to be healed and is not enough to read about it. You have to be convinced on the emotional level. That means emotional or the feeling of God's love as well as the feeling of our misery are very are correlative. And this, this is the poles that he works with as he gradually brings us out of this immature levels of relating to him and to everybody else and to ourselves into an ever-increasing liberation, freedom, the capacity to give, the capacity to, to give to others, the compassion we've learned to give to ourselves. And, and the deeper the experience of God's mercy, the more compassion you can show to others. And the deeper your experience of your need of God, desperate need of God for healing, is the measure in which you experience the infinite mercy. So that at some point, when you have nothing left, it suddenly dawns on you that you have the infinite mercy of God, nothing else. But my God, what else do you want? <laughs> if you have that, you don't need anything else. And, and when that dawns on you, then the spiritual journey is, is not going to be put off by any trial whatsoever. Trust emerges with such force in that confrontation, and it's trust that leads to perfect love, nothing else. Certainly not fear. Fear, in our Lord's words, is useless. We ought to believe the gospel. Now, I think I've said enough then <laughs> about that experience, but just to conclude it, why was this young man, fairly generous by any standard I dare to claim at this point, though somewhat naive and ill-informed, why this generous young man? given up so much, comes into the monastery, does everything he's supposed to do, <laughs> kneels down, <laughs> prays as much as he can, fulfills all the injunctions of the superiors, ad amplius, which means an even more than they ask, and, and, and he suffers such thoughts. Where did they come from? He experiences envy, the most primitive emotions, and jealousy. What, what was my problem? Evidently, one of these programs in the unconscious was still in place. Was it security? Was I using that time of prayer as a security blanket? Maybe. Maybe not. Or was prayer in that monastery where the abbot was talking it up and where the whole life was orientated towards contemplation, was I secretly in competition with the other monks and somewhat like that guy who fasted everybody under the table, <laughs> was I sort of praying everybody under the table? And prayer, you see, was my idea of prayer. That's something else that God sometimes attacks. And, and after I got through that particular trial, another one occurred. <laughs> they come right pretty regularly at that time in the... Here. I, I did most of my praying before the Blessed Sacrament in church. And so I identified prayer with that place. Not totally, I had enough sense to know God is everywhere, and I experienced him at other times. You know, the, the in invitation to interior silence that overtakes you at times. But again, and this brings us into this mythic membership thing. You see, Mythic membership mentality is entrenched in early childhood. 
monastic life is another bout with, uh, with childhood. So uh, just as we have a superego as a result of, of interiorizing the values of parents unquestioningly, so the good religious interiorizes unquestioningly the value systems of the life he's embracing. So it's almost a second childhood. And so if you're taught certain things, then that's the way it should be. And so you, as, as life goes on and you normalize a number of your relations, because that's such an important period in your life, this total experience of dedication when you're withdrawn from family, friends, occupation, everything, you're extremely vulnerable. So once again, you develop mythical membership habits of functioning. And so there's a kind of monastic or religious superego that goes off when things are not according to what the novice master or, or your teacher said they should be, which have never been thoroughly processed by reason and faith. Okay. So I probably had this further residue of thinking to really pray and become a contemplative. I've got to pray in church for a couple of hours a day. So how, what did God do with that? <laughs> he gave me a little illness that caused me to be sick for two years, mostly in bed, and in a place where I couldn't get anywhere near the Blessed Sacrament. <laughs> so <laughs> this, this business of dealing with the Lord or following Him is like dealing with somebody else who, you know, who not only is a psychotherapist and has insights into what's wrong with you, but has all kinds of other gifts who happens to be God, okay. So God, with this incredible accuracy, constantly, if we're in game, puts his finger on exactly the spot that needs attention. And it usually involves giving him just a little bit more than we want to. Not too much, just a little bit more. So it's always more, <laughs> always uh, let, would you let go of this little thing? And it's, it, we've given up almost everything, and we're just hanging on to this one last shred of possessiveness to hold. And, and sure enough, he comes along and says, oh, isn't, won't you please give me that? <laughs> so it, 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 you've got to have a sense of humor, and you've got to realize that this is what is called friendship and training <laughs> and love. But this God of ours is, is like no earthly parent. He's, he's incredibly wise, incredibly generous, incredibly patient, but incredibly honest. And that's what is a little painful every now and then, if we aren't honest. But he's, he's, he's training us like a, little, like a father, his little son. And in, in the great uh, poem of Moses in Deuteronomy, uh, he, he compares God's training to, to an eagle training its little eaglet to fly. And at least in their day, their understanding of that bird was that the way that the eaglet learns to fly is by being pushed out of the nest before it can fly. Now this is a marvelous <laughs> image of what happens to us. God is constantly pushing into something which we feel totally incapable of doing. And so if you look over your shoulder, uh, you, you, you wonder whether he still loves you. But he pushes you out nonchalantly. Go on, just fly. And so this poor little thing is flapping and it's not working and it's heading straight for the abyss. And all of a sudden, this, the mother bird, with absolute accuracy, comes swooping down and catches it on her wings just as before it hits. So after this has gone on a couple of hundred times, the darn thing learns to fly. Okay. So, after we've been treated this way about a hundred times, you're, you begin to realize that maybe it's not so dangerous as it looks or felt the first time. And you not only begin to be content with your dependency on these, on these thrilling escapes from certain death or, or misery, <laughs> but you begin uh, to trust God, to be, to be content with His action and the way He treats you. And, and you begin to trust in his love beyond your psychological experience. And so that makes the relationship a lot more pleasant. Now, the <coughs> this, this <laughs> superego of ours, which is characteristic of, 
of the mythical membership kind of consciousness, of course, is, is obvious in uh, working in society as well as in us. Society is just an, the accumulation of people. So uh, now that the many people have moved into the low egoic period of, of, uh, uh, of rational human life, they constantly are also falling back into the mythical membership. They're not fully established at these, this level. And so uh, we see this on the level of nations. I mean, uh, national uh, negotiations are still based on, on, as far as I can see, the, the rules of the sandbox. That is to say, <laughs> it's a youngster who, who has found out how nice it is to be in charge of his sandbox. So another guy gets the same idea, so he tries to get in it. So there's a little confrontation, and, and one says, get out of my sand sandbox. And the other says, I'm coming into your sandbox. No, you aren't. Yes, I am. No, you aren't. Yes, I am. Then it gets louder. No, you aren't. Yes, I am. And then finally they come to blows, and the whoever is stronger pushes the other guy out. And since that's so much fun, he goes on to another sandbox. And, and, and that's even more fun until finally he has a whole, uh, what do you call those things? aligned group of <laughs> sandboxes to back up his tyranny. Okay, Well, is that the human way to solve international difficulties? Uh, obviously, it's childish. Imagine, with all this weaponry, uh, it's not the sandbox anymore. They don't seem to have discovered that, that it's not a question of, of taking a BB gun and get the other guy out. <laughs> You've got enough stuff to kill yourselves as well as him, as everybody else. So. The human family has got to grow up, or is going to destroy it. These, these are not toys anymore. But the emotional place from which these negotiations are coming seems to be the kind of, of, of reactions that are suitable for the sandbox, but not beyond. So, so instead of cooperation between nations, which is the human way of doing things, negotiating, <laughs> we see still this, this power politics, this exploitation, this uh, my country right or wrong, uh, my ideology is better than your ideology, all of which is strictly mythical membership stuff and is destroying the world. And until we move into the sense of belonging to the human family, not just our nation, we haven't really entered into uh, the full mental egoic consciousness. And that alone is rational and, 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 and personal, fully personal at least. So it's, it's uh, also apparent on the, in the level of, of, uh, of religious life. For instance, here is how, how this, the child at that level, through group over-identification, having unquestionably absorbed the values of parents, along with the neurotic guilt feelings that go with them, <laughs> will say, my daddy is better than your daddy. Uh, our athletes are better than your athletes in our school. Uh, the Russians are not as good at skiing as, as our skiers. Okay. Our ministers are better than your ministers. Our priests are better than your priests. My religion is better than your religion. Okay. Now, there may be, they may be better for all I know. The point is, that's not where the judgment is coming from. The judgment is coming from our need to belong to the society that is unsurpassed, because that backs up our need for survival and security, esteem, affection, or power and control. We want to belong to the winning team, not because we love the winning team, or still less the losing team, because we love ourselves in a distorted way, not truly. So the true love <laughs> removes doors, windows, barriers, territories. At least it moves in that direction. It may not be able to do so because it has to wait for other people to grow up too. But it's inclined to negotiate to the nth degree. And, and, and while uh, it's obvious that the nations are trying to negotiate, as long as they're heavily committed to their ideology, to their territorial rights, and all these things, they are proportionately not committed to the human family, and that's the object of concern for someone in mental egoic consciousness. 
and, and the world is becoming one family, whether we like it or not, through mass media communications and the interaction on every level, except spirituality, the one level that would unite the human family at its, where it is truly one, and which could then endure the diversity and respect the diversity and pluralism of different cultures, ethnic groups. And now, this is not to say that this level of consciousness is not good. We should have a loyalty to our family, country, and teachers, and, and whatever good we have received from anyone. But this loyalty is not an absolute, but it's a loyalty, if it's enlightened by the mentally egoic consciousness, that, that can also recognize in order to change the limitations in our own organization, whatever these are, if we're qualified to make a judgment about it. Hence, this level presupposes personal responsibility for our group insofar as we can influence it for good and, and have some qualifications, especially in union with other reasonable and rational people, that some improvement might be done. Now, there are structures of government that belong to this level, and they are mostly a monarchical dictatorial form or a heavy authoritarian uh, form of government. The mental egoic, since it involves personal responsibility for our group, for the future, for human history, <laughs> is inclined towards a, a more participatory government. Democracy, not necessarily a final opinion uh, chosen in, by, uh, by the majority, since that also can be a form of tyranny, but rather a, a participatory form of government in which a broad constituency of capable people are consulted so that the final judgment of, of the body or the person who is appointed to make the final decision is enlightened by all the facts. And in our time, the facts are more and more complex. Hence, the experts that need to be consulted and the time taken before a final judgment is made on things has to be more comprehensive. So uh, the, the thing, perhaps, that destroys uh, relations between peoples, just as it destroys it between us and God, is the passion of fear, that is, to be afraid of God, to be afraid of other people, because that's what makes us defensive. In the case of God, we stay away from him. In the case of other people, we try to control them, and keep them within the limits that enables us not to feel the uneasiness that comes from fear. Fear, remember, is that emotion, which is an emergency appetite, in the emergency appetite, which perceives an evil as an impending disaster that hasn't quite arrived. Uh, anger is, when, is the emotion that one feels when it has arrived. And hence, one responds to that in various uh, ways, as, as we saw in discussing the ways that we react when angry according to temperament. Um, the fear of God is not the emotion of fear. It's, it's rather respect, reverence, awe for God's transcendence and trust in his imminence, both of which seem like uh, opposites but are put together through the experience of transcendence, namely through deep prayer, in other words, through contemplation. Contemplation is what reroutes us in reality in the universe without losing our identity. Uh, let me give you this example of what the fear of God is, because I think it might be helpful since we, we don't have, we probably have some, some wrong images of what it is from our, from our early mythical membership instruction in early childhood. Uh, let's pretend that a, a child at Christmas time is coming to see the toys at some big apartment store, Bloomingdale's in New York, or, or some where the whole floor is nothing but toys. It covers a whole block, let us say. And, and so this little fellow with his mother holding her hand 
emerges from the elevator into this world of toys. Well, his eyes just get bigger and bigger. He looks in this direction and in that direction. Everywhere he looks is everything his little heart ever desired. Skis, tea bears, doll houses, sleds, uh, Santa Claus, trains, computers, everything a child could possibly desire. And it wants to go in every direction at once. And it's just overwhelmed because it can't move because it, uh, you can't go in every direction at once. And so it's, it's, just, it's, it's just so thrilled with everything that it doesn't know where to start. And it wants to take it all home and enjoy it. It doesn't want to have to make a choice. Now, now this is what the fear of God means. It means that we feel ourselves invited into this mystery that contains everything our heart could possibly desire. And it's the fascination of mystery, not the fear of mystery, that attracts us as well as that little child. We want to rush into everything we can know, feel, understand, or be conscious enough of this mystery that opens endlessly from our perspective in every direction. Now that is what the fear of God is. That is the right relationship with God, which is uh, the right translation of that technical term, which is to trust the mystery and to be fascinated by it, and, and thus to pursue it on every level of our being with the confidence, sure confidence, that whatever we receive is going to be infinitely beyond anything that we can possibly imagine with our limited experience.